Binary friends, everyone on the spectrum and in between. My name is Ken Stagnick. This is another episode of the Shutter Show, and this is my host, David Marlowe. David, how are you doing today? You know, I'm doing pretty damn well. Uh, I've been, I've been, I've worked nine straight days of of almost nothing but twelve hour shifts, uh, doing a Westfield job where all the frames we've built are metal, and we have to uh, fasten. Skins onto them that are MDF fire retardant material, and it is literally the heaviest thing that you've ever fucking had to lift. And I've been doing that for nine days straight, and it's nice just to have a day. Nice to have a day where my body's not on fire. Now, when I when you say animal uh, when you say skins, I assume you mean like animal skins, and that your job is a leather tanner, and that these are like buffalo skins, or you uh, fucking cold it, bud, man. Okay, you are, good. You are a you are a beast at figuring this shit. <laughs> No, it, it's it's just the, you know, it. sorry, I bumped the mic there for a uh, It's pretty much like, we'll pass it over to the scenic painters, and that's just the material that they will paint over. So and you're a carpenter, will... like Jesus, correct? Uh, yes, exactly okay. like Good. Jesus. Yeah. I don't use okay. machines or anything. I use wooden nails. I don't fuck around with that modern day crap. I think we both know that Jesus didn't use machines. I think that is... Uh, there's No, he was the machine. That This is true. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> now, David, speaking of machines, um, what movie did we watch this week? Which is the worst transition I think I have ever engaged in, <laughs> in the fact that it is a hard left turn into a wall that I completely messed up. Uh, what, what movie are we talking about this week? You know what? That transition was perfect. Don't you, don't you belittle you. yourself, Ken. Will, thank you. You're a beautiful creature. You know who's also a beautiful creature? Ginger from Ginger Snaps. Uh, and that is the movie that we are fucking talking about today, baby. We are talking about Canadian werewolves. And uh, let me say, not only does Ginger Snaps, but Ginger Slaps. This is... It has been, it had been a long time since I had seen this movie. I had seen it initially when it came out because I am an old... Um, I actually graduated high school the year before this movie came out because I am an old. And um, I had forgotten just how great this movie is. This is, this is maybe my, my favorite movie of the things that we have watched so far. This and Dead and Buried are two hands down, are the two movies that I've been like, oh, yeah, that's why I started doing this because I get to rewatch these movies that it turns out are are really great. And yeah, let me say, I love me some Canadian werewolves. And I gotta say, you know, once again, as is the the majority of the format on this, this podcast, I have not seen this. And I was very pleasantly surprised by this. This is one of those movies that when I, you know, uh, to, to make all you uh, younger people understand how old I am, I remember when I used to go to the video store um, and that would always be on the horror shelf. And it was one of those things where it's just like, like I saw it and just kind of like, like, like it looks kind of like just like a gothic chick film. At least that was sort of the, that was my method that of thinking. That was that, the that was, my, that was my 90s method of thinking back in the day. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, like, ah, that doesn't really look oh. that scary. It kind of just looks, eh. Because, yeah, it, it's, I mean, and, and then in like Ginger Snaps, once you realize the main character's name is Ginger, you're suddenly like, oh, that kind of works. But yeah, I thought it was like a Christmas cookie thing. Yeah, no, exactly. It's it's one of those. Um, I would put it up there with um, uh, the TV show Terriers, and I would put it up there with um, uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. With one of those titles that, like, you're like after you've seen the movie, you're kind of like, yeah, that's I get it. Good. I like it. That's Tucker nice. and Dale, which, by the way, if any of you have not seen Tucker and Dale, oh, do yourselves so a favor and oh. see it. It is wonderful. It is one of Alan Tudyk's best fucking films. Also, the villain in that film happens to be uh, in this film as well. Mm-hmm. Like, and also, I would like to let everyone know I also loved this film very much. It, it was it, like going into it. I my first thought was this is '90s as fuck, and but not '90s in the like oh it's we're doing a period piece. It's not. It's not Captain Marvel. '90s. Yes. No. 
It's um, I know exactly it, what you mean. Ex- yeah. <laughs> Or it's like, like, like we, we play Gwen Stefani, so that means we're 90s. It's not trying to remind Fuck you off. that it's the 90s. It is, it is just 90s because this movie was, was released in 2000, was shot in 99, was, they had early drafts going back as far as 2000, or sorry, as far as uh, 1995. Did you get the burp out? Um, yes, thank you. I hate you so much. Anyway, <laughs> um, going back to 1995, this movie is a movie that was conceived in the 90s, the 90s that was made in the 90s, that was produced in the 90s, so of course it is incredibly 90s in the same way um, that you would say that Go is incredibly 90s or Fight Club is incredibly 90s because it just they were is. made in the 90s, but it is, it is pure. It is not putting on airs. It is not pretending. It is... Just what it is, and, and because well, because it takes place in high school as well. Like, I feel more of a connection to it because, like, yeah, that's kind of what I was wearing back then, hundred percent. Well, that's what all the kids around me were wearing because I had no sense of fashion or how to look good back then because I was a stupid child of the nineties. Now, David, question: Which high school movies would you associate with Ginger Snaps the most? Um, a more modern film I would associate this with is Jennifer's Body. And I've, okay. seen, I, I've seen a comparison to Jennifer's... I, I've seen people compare it to that film very often. Oh, definitely. Um, so, like, I, just the snow, slow-mo shot of, of Ginger walking, walking down, down the yeah. hallway is like literally like, all right, come on, Jennifer's Body. Yeah. You're, you're doing... But like you did that shot or you unconsciously did that shot, but you did that shot. But, but, but a far more recognizable classic that I think would be the best comparison to this would be Carrie. Well, of because course. It, because it is very much... Like, this film is literally a period film. Yes. No, 100%. Um, in that it is just about what it means to be a woman, um, a teenage woman, whose body is going through some ta- some changes. Well, I, and I, also I'd the say... fact that children at that age are quite cruel. And so to go through that change while surrounded by cruel people, can be very traumatizing. I, I would say it's a movie about anyone transforming in any like any kind of transformative way, whether it's in high school, whether it's um, uh, with a woman coming into her own um, uh, with puberty, um, whether it's um, a man coming into his own uh, with his own puberty, whether it's uh, a person transitioning, um, all of these metaphors I think work and are addressed in this movie. I think it it does a great job of truly um, truly taking advantage of the metaphor that it has created. And something that I wanted to make sure to point out is in the commentary track, the writer Karen Walton, who I think did a fantastic job on this and I highly recommend if you get a chance to check out the commentary track that she talks about because she really talks about her journey on making this movie and how as a screenwriter she was someone who never liked horror movies who never liked the way that women were portrayed in horror movies and as a result she was challenged by the director uh, John Fawcett to write a horror movie that she would want to see. And that's why I think you get such an interesting perspective on this. And I wanted to take a moment to point out the contribution of someone who doesn't have a credit up top, who only has a credit in the end credits, but Karen Walton, the writer, wanted to take time during the commentary to point out, and he is a fellow Ken, so I also wanted to take (laughs) the time to point him out. Ken Chubb is the story editor, and he was the one who kind of leaned in to both John Fawcett and Karen Walton and said, like, you have this great metaphor going with a woman in her time of transition. You really need to lean into that. And he really helped them craft and mold the script and through all of their rewrites, bring this idea to the forefront. And I think that is one of the things that Ginger Mm -hmm. Snaps does better than almost... It does better than so many yeah. modern films, I and, will and say. I, I, I completely agree. I think this, this touches on that particular topic. It, t- it touches on the changing of women's bodies at that age. And in, at a time when that was very much not something to talk about. And I, I really appreciate this being um, a director who, like you say, leans in to the female writer and actually, like, in, for does the thing that a male 
that, that, that an ally of women should do, which is to just lift them up and lift be and like, listen. yeah, lift, yeah, lift and listen. Pretty much being like, you have this thing, and I think like it means, I can tell it means a lot to you. I think we should really, I, I think we should really go in on this and and go for what it is that you want to do specifically. Well, and I also think that it really, it, it's one of the, it is one of those notes that you get from another writer that just helps you it's like a tuning fork for the whole script once you find that one note um francis ford coppola talks about how when he's making a movie he tries to find like a word or a sentence that is kind of the whole kit and caboodle and that is something that he will then continuously keep coming back to and ask, how does this inform what we are talking about? Yeah. And actually, um, speaking of uh, both uh, Karen Walton and uh, our director, John Fawcett, something I just wanted to bring up. These two ended up working uh, again later. Um, they are the creators of uh, uh, Orphan Black. And while the... Yes, I did see mm-hmm. that. Yeah. While which, the... and I have seen the first season of Orphan Black, which, fuck, that's a good show. It's so good. Uh, the the director John Fawcett is is ha, a, as a result of this film has gone on to do a uh, a lot of stuff. He worked on the uh, John Woo TV series Once a Thief. Um, he worked oh, which he got before this and then after this he worked on Xena Warrior Princess. He worked on uh, Queer's Folk, the American remake. Uh, one episode of the Blade TV series, The Bridge, the Spartacus uh, TV show, uh, Lost Girl. And, but Orphan Black and uh, and a couple episodes also of uh, Man in the High Castle. So he clearly worked for um, Ridley Scott there. I think one actually interesting crossover that I've been trying to find the answers to, but I haven't quite figured them out yet, is Lucy Lawless actually has a little tiny cameo in Ginger Snaps. Shut the fuck up. Where? She is the voice of the person on the loudspeaker in the school. But... Interestingly, he directed this, at least according to IMDb, before Ginger Snaps. Like just, Ginger Snaps was before Xena. So I don't know what his connection with Lucy there was. I was trying to hunt around and find out if, if you guys know uh, out there in the internet, please. I would love to know how how he got Lucy lost. Or if it's just, it might very well be one of those weird little things where like, like in the same way that George Clooney is in Attack... Uh, sorry, is in Grizzly 2. <laughs> the unreleased sequel to Grizzly that I believe is finally getting a release next year because they found a print, like, in a closet somewhere. But it's just... They're like, it's 2020. Nothing's getting made now. Well, it's sometimes... Might as well. Well, sometimes it's one of those, a movie gets lost and just an actor happened to be famous before they were in a thing um, Butterfly Effect with Ashton Kutcher from what I understand sat on the shelf for years and yeah. then Ashton Kutcher while he had been a Gucci model and had been oh, he, somewhat so, of so a he, celebrity so Ashton Kutcher did this film before he became yes before he became famous on that 70s show and then once that 70s show hit and he became Ashton Kutcher suddenly somebody was like hey I got a movie with that kid in it. I bet you we... Donnie Darko's popular now. I bet you... Why don't we do another film about the end where where the whole thing is just kill yourself? Definitely the time of Blockbuster. um, And definitely... Definitely one of those movies that is... uh, Was playing off of the success of Donnie Darko, which was a big success, kind of out of nowhere. So it does not... It would not... Surprise me at all if specifically Donnie Darko was the movie that they were pivoting off of. But it also was one of those sometimes you find out. Uh, was I, I believe American Psycho 2 was also the same way, which starred a uh, Mila Kunis before she was big. Yeah. And I don't even believe it was called American Psycho 2 at first. I believe it had a completely separate title. And it was more of one of those, well, we bought the title to American Psycho and we can kind of... Yeah. Back our way into this, and if you happen to rent it at Blockbuster, and you are then upset that it's not really American Psycho 2, I guess that's this, on you, right? This this is a film that contains a lot of actors that 
look very familiar. You're like, I've seen you somewhere. Where the fuck have I seen you? And I guess, like, let me let me kind of take a little bit of a dive on that one. Go for it. Um, Emily Perkins, who plays Bridget, the younger sister, um, she looked so damn familiar. And one of the things that really upset my wife was how bad that wig was that she was wearing. She could, like, my, my, my lovely fiancé, not really my wife, but I just like calling her my wife. Future um, wife. My future wife. Uh, Thanks, she, Tommy. She has a thing... Like, she has a real talent for spotting bad wigs. Like, it's not something that I really ever pay attention to, but just out of the blue, we'll be watching a movie. She was like, oh my god, I can't stop looking at that fucking terrible wig. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's wearing a wig. Is and then she... you suddenly, that's all you can and see. And then, yeah, and then she ruins the movie for me. So, thanks, hun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was her biggest comment on, on her performance. It was like, I'm sorry I couldn't concentrate on her performance. I was too busy looking at that atrocious wig. Um, I don't think it's throughout the whole film. I have, I have a feeling that's one of those that that is a reshoot wig, which is one yeah. of those things that unfortunately are just kind of part of the. All right, well, yeah, but when you make movies, sometimes your option is can they wear a wig, or mm-hmm. do we not want to do a, four days of reshoots and save the movie? Yeah, and the answer is usually. You want to you wanna go do the reshoots because yeah. nobody normal is going to notice. And I love you, Katie, but nobody normal is going to notice. <laughs> so, but yeah, so th- th- the whole time I'm looking at her, she looks so goddamn familiar. Where the fuck have I seen her? Um, and this shocks me that this isn't in her known for filmography on IMDb, but she played Beverly in the original It. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So she, she played Beverly. Yeah. And so when you look at her, like, and then finally when you look at a picture of Beverly from that film, you're like, yes, well, of I course. Compl- I completely yeah. see it. I completely see it now. She also was the punk receptionist in Juno. Um, she was uh, a Eunice in She's the Man. So, like, she, she's been all over the place. And just like um, Catherine Isabel, um, who also was one of those people, like, I've seen you around. I know you're in a lot of things that people, under- that people know. But what poster have I fucking seen you from? American Mary. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, totally. So she is an American Mary, a film that was directed by two female twins, or yes. technically female twins, not two, because I would uh, inquire that was is it the that, that would that would is it the Sakosa sisters. Uh, let me check. So Seco- I, I do believe so. Yes, uh, okay. yes, Jen Jen Seco- Jen Seco- so- Soska. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, we won't get into that now. They are uh, some. Interesting, right wing, right wing oh, leaning no. people. Yeah, yeah. It's a real uh, one of those. Oh, I wanted to, but hey, yeah, yeah. It's mm, it's one of those. We will get into it. Uh, I've, day. I've I've watched a couple of interviews where she's literally sitting between the two of them, and they're talking, and she looks, and Catherine looks so uncomfortable. She uh, she went hard to the mat for Dean Kane, who is a real interesting, very Christian person. Um, uh, but she was also one of the teens that got killed off in Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, that's neat. Okay, yeah. cool. She was the one whose boyfriend got, you know, folded in half by Jason at the very mm, beginning of the film. Okay. Um, she was also in Insomnia. She, she's, she's been all over the fucking place. But she's one of the, once, once again, like, one of those actresses where you're just like, I've seen you. I don't know who the fuck you're, I don't know what your fucking name is. But I've seen you all over the place. See, the person for that for me in this movie was Jesse Moss. And he is in uh, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, where he is the bad frat guy. And it was so one of those cases where I was like, Oh, that guy from that thing that I couldn't place. Of course. (laughs) Also, Final Destination 3. Uh, Sure, (laughs) why not? But, like, for me, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil is one of those... It's a special place uh, in my heart. Yeah, it is a real special place in my heart kind of a movie. Um, Obviously, also, Mimi Rogers in this, and cool. Mimi Rogers, I think, is is fine. She's a real coming in, I'm sure, to pick up a very nice... She did a very good... She had a... I will say, like, she had a very good performance in this, especially at the end... She, at first it seemed like, oh, she's kind of a, you know, throw away joke. She's the, the, like, she's the typical mom who wants to be the cool mom trying to explain everything to her daughters who are mortified by the information she's giving them. But then at the end, she has a very human moment. Yes. That I thought was, like, kind of, like, almost made me go, 
Oh, good. Mm. Emotions. What, 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 she, what, mm. um, she is the reason why you hire a pro like Mimi Rogers for a part like this. Because what you are asking her to do in a terrible spare, uh, sports metaphor that I'm, I'm probably going to not express terribly well. She is the person that when like, she is the designated hitter that you assign to be like, no, no, no. I need someone who I know is going to hit the ball here. No, no, no. She doesn't have to hit a home run. She doesn't have, like, she needs to get a single or a double. But I need, like, a better than 80% chance that she is going to just, I, I just don't want to worry about this. You know why? That's why I hire Mimi Rogers. It's like, it's like hiring Glenn Close or Meryl Streep or Clive Owen or uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman when he was still alive. One of those guys that you're like, okay, that is, I don't have to deal with that anymore. I might have to say faster or slower. I'm going to have to tell him when to stop talking because that's just how being a director works. But I'm not going to have to like do anything. You know what I mean? Like one of yeah. those guys, one of those people that you hire that is just like, well, that is settled. Mm -hmm. That person will take care of that, and I never have to worry about it uh, again. And and yeah, and and she uh, she she yeah, she rounds out that performance. Um, and I guess yeah, was it the only other person? I guess is was Chris Chris Lenchy is almost Christian Slater. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he he's the cheap man's Christian Slater. Yes, one of those definitely weird, the yeah, like oh, that's like how an upgrade. What's what's his face is the cheap. Uh, Yes. The, no, the we, cheap man's uh, Tom Hardy. Yes. No, the cheap man's you. That, that yeah. also works. Uh, upgrade is, uh, what is his name? Uh, blah, 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 blah. It is, why is this laid out this way? This is terrible. Logan Marshall Green. There we go. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the actor's name is Logan Marshall Green. So, uh, folks, if you can't afford Logan Marshall Green. Uh, David Marlowe. You want to know who you can hire who looks very much like him and doesn't, doesn't suck too bad when it comes to acting? This he, guy. He, he even brings his own trailer, and it's called his car. Um, <laughs> so, now... See ya. Um, David, let me ask, uh, because we haven't, we haven't even just approached the basic question. Do you like this movie? I loved, I like, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. It, it, like, it's one of those things where it literally starts with a close-up shot of her pretending to cut her wrists uh, of the main character, Ginger. Totally. Um, that was almost one of those things I'm just like, okay, all right, where are we going with this? Because th I do also think it was very topical because this, this movie, and this is something that I feel like you and I can both talk about openly because we're going to dive in a little bit on the whole female period thing as to white cis men uh, that, that which you know we'll, we'll try our best and please don't add us um, but the, one of the things I think is is not necessarily glossed over but actually very heavily approached is is mental health mm -hmm. in this and, and so at first when like that's the open that's the opening shot I'm just like okay where are you going with this because as somebody who I, like I will say like depression and anxiety and it's uh, are two things that I have struggled dearly with throughout my life. I also like diagnosed ADD, which added to to all of that, and and so I do remember coming up in the '90s and in the early 2000s in school, and mental health was not something that it was barely being talked about. Yes, it, it was definitely it, not. It like... was. It was. I think they were finally like the like. The professionals were finally poking their heads out of the hole to see if it was okay to start maybe experimenting with it. But I was legit the poster child for Ritalin. Um, this was that medication that you just, you circle, you drew a giant circle around all of the mental health problems and you threw one pill at it. That was the age that this movie was made in. And around that time, it was not, it was considered very lame or, or so, you know, emo to talk about suicide. But then you have these two female characters who are very open about it. And they're just like, no, nah, suicide and death is fascinating. I, I think... And it's... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, it, it was so... It, 
the shot that it started on with the cutting of the wrists, I'm just like, oh, it, like you're poking fun at the emo goth culture when really the emo goth culture was very much uh, an identity and self-defense mechanism against a society that did not want to openly talk about mental health. I would say an interesting thing to consider here is that, A, this is a movie that was written, shot, and we're in editing before Columbine happened. And that, yes. I think, completely yeah. kind of changes your... Like, the way of looking at this is one of those real, like... Like, like looking at airport security in a movie before 9-11, where it's like, well... Of course you could have a scene where someone runs through an airport, bursts through security, and then runs up to a woman and kisses her on the face. And then, like, the next shot isn't them being shot and tasered for running through airport security because that's just not a thing you can do. Well, but that was a thing you used to be able to do. Um, a thing I don't know if you, if you knew, David, it wasn't until, like, the 1960s that, um, quote-unquote, sky piracy which is the coolest of all of the crimes that anyone could commit, especially in the 60s, was officially made illegal. Before then, no one had really made a law that you couldn't just take over an airplane and force it where you wanted it to fly with a gun because nobody had ever been like, well, that's the thing we should make a law against because, of course, that's something someone's going to do and they're not going to do A law exists it. specifically because somebody tried it more than once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one yeah. of those... Like, <laughs> that's you... why when you see a sign in a park that seems like the dumbest thing, it's very depressing because you're like, more than one person has tried this. God damn it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, you have to feed your crew members every six hours on a film set. Well, that's crazy. Of course you'd, film your, your, you'd feed your film... Like your crew members every six hours. Who would do that? Not if you're a shitty student filmmaker with uh, with no budget. Yeah, or if you're just a monstrous producer who just doesn't want to pay for things, then Rumpf. yeah. Rumpf. Every now and then you have to make a law that's like, I need you to feed some people. No, but you need to pay them. Because like, people are human, and sometimes yeah. humans don't show the bare minimum of humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't force them to shit in the yeah. bucket. But yeah, it's so, a real, like, that's not... No, but there's a rule, because... Someone did a thing. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, like I very much enjoyed this film. It started out in, in, in a sense of, of being skeptical, but then seeing as they, but then once you got to know Bridget and Ginger as two separate characters, and then you saw the high school that they were coming up in, and then you just you realized that the film did a very good job of humanizing everybody. At first, everyone starts off as a type, but then as the film goes along, that type turns more human. Even um, the asshole jock who, um, who she attacks and then, you know, ends up becoming a werewolf himself or is about to turn into a werewolf himself. He, he has some very human moments of vulnerability where finally he's the one that's getting made fun of or he's the one that's humiliated. And it, once in, it takes also the topic of puberty and it presents it a little bit towards men as well. You're like, hey... We know your bodies do weird stuff too around that time. Bet it freaks you out a little bit. Bet you're wondering where all that hair's coming from or why you haven't got hair there yet and why that might be humiliating to your ego. Um, not nearly as traumatic as what women have to go through in puberty, but No. But he's like, but you know, it's it's one of the it were, it's it was a very good reminder to a lot of kids who are currently in who are in high school right now. I think the best thing you can tell them is like, "Hey, that thing that you're going through right now, and feel really humiliated by it, I'm going to tell you a secret. Every single one of your friends is going through, has gone through, or is about to go through that exact same thing, and they just don't talk about it because they're all so embarrassed by it. In fact, sometimes they get very angry and they're a bully about it because they're insecure. And I think this film really handles that brilliantly. And it's, it was just, it was one of those things where as it went along, I'm just like, God damn, good job. Good fucking job. This, this is a movie that I think really, um, really threads the needle on several different issues. It is able to, it is a movie that clearly does not have a lot of money, but is able to lightly show 
to, to briefly show the special effects shots or the gore shots or those wet moments sporadically and briefly so they can get the most out of it. They are able to make a high school film that just absolutely rules. They are able to make a body horror movie that absolutely rules. Um, it is a great creature feature. Um, and it it is the balancing act of all of those things that I think is the most impressive. It is the understanding of why it is important to leave in the scene where you where the sister is taping down Ginger's tail to try and hide it at high school. Understanding that like part of the journey is the embarrassment, but part of the journey is the transformation and then part of what makes it high school is the hiding it. It is and that is also a scene that is quote unquote not important. It is not a scene that moves things forward plot wise but it tells you so much about the reality of these characters and how much these how much the writer and the director are taking this situation as crazy as it is the idea of oh I'm going to become a werewolf taking it seriously making it real making it resonate making it be part of something that I can understand as part of my emotional experience and that is one of the things that i find with modern horror that very often is missing it's like okay cool this couple is married and they're getting divorced because they don't like each other very much neat glad i can have two people just scream at each other and i don't understand why they're mad or i don't understand where they're coming from and i don't understand both sides of their story i just understand that oh they're mad and conflict is drama and because apparently whoever wrote this did one day of drama school where they were told that drama is conflict i have to listen to these two people shriek at each other about nothing when something like they last week shows that you know you can have that couple get along or you can it doesn't it doesn't have to be what everyone else is doing. You can show the complexity of either the way that these two people get along and their complex relationship like we have here or like when with Tucker and Dale versus Evil which we were talking about earlier. I mean that is a movie about pure platonic male friendship. There's no fighting between them really. There's like some vague minor bickering. Yeah. But same thing kind of here. The like the only the the disputes that you see are the ones that grow within the film it, uh, like itself. And that is one of the things one of the biggest contributions Karen Walton the writer does that I think is so important is making this not a horror movie first and making it a, a movie about these characters who happen to be stuck in a horror movie. Instead, it is so easy for people to approach horror movies from a couple of different ways. The first one being, we're making a stupid horror movie and people who like horror movies are stupid, so here's some stupid crap, eat up the slop. And then there are people who love horror and make horror movies for horror people. And that's kind of it. And if you're not a horror person, it's kind of a weird specific thing. Those are, strangely enough, a lot of my friends, and especially Mm -hmm. like... Especially a lot of my friends from college. Like, I, which happen to be some of, my, like, my favorite friends. They're just like, like, like you're weird. I, li- I like it. Like, like you're, you're weird in a very charming way. C- college is where we make our best, weirdest friends. Yeah. And they might not always be friends that we want to be our roommates, but they are always people that oh, we are Oh, one of them was glad. definitely my roommate, and he was my best friend. <laughs> but, but one of them is all, but like, it's... Hi, Scott. It is one of those... A lot of them are the kind of people that you're very glad that you're met, but you, you're pretty glad that you don't live with. Like, I'm glad I, I learned from you. I'm glad I saw this. I'm glad I experienced it. However, I would not I'm know. 30-something now, and my priorities have changed. Yeah. I would not know who Mr. Bungle is without my, my dear friend Scott Palmer, who is a sound, um, uh, who's a sound designer in, um, in Chicago. Wonderful, wonderful human being. If you're ever working on a film in Chicago, please hire him. He is the best of the best. And I think he is the most like you of the friends that I have. He has, I would almost say, as big a collection of movies as you do. And just as much equipment. 
Good times. Well, we might yeah. need to meet each other eventually. Yeah. Um, now, um, let's see here. Some things I want to bring up. Uh, first off, we probably should have mentioned this up top. Um, there is some pretty unfortunate dog death in this movie. There's not a lot of... There's, there's not like a particular scene where they are particularly mean to a dog. They, they don't show the dogs dying, but, but they show dead if dogs. If that is a thing that you are sensitive to uh we will understand if this is a movie that you have to tap out on but it's something i wanted to bring up b if you uh, so you mentioned that katie is very um it's very particular about when they wear bad wigs i as someone who smoked for a long time am pretty particular about when people are smoking and i will not lie this has some of the worst fake teenage smoking I have seen where it's just like no they don't you don't hold a cigarette like that and you but they're also teenager smoking but you though. breathe it in longer like it's just but they're it, also but they're also teenagers 100% smoking. but it's a it, it was it was one of those it was 100% across the board nobody smoked well in this movie I remember smoking cigarettes in high school sorry mom um you remember like there was like a little connects box that I had, that I, that I hid my pack in. Oh, interesting. The Legos. Oh. That's an interesting Oh, move. I was a clever shrew. There we go. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, and... Um, oh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was something that I noticed that I thought was one of those interesting, oh, wow, that really resonates through the whole movie kind of a thing. So when Ginger gets bit and becomes... what well, gets infected with the lycanthropy or the werewolf disease... It happens right at the edge of the suburbs and the wilderness. And even the screenwriter brought this up that that originally this scene was written in a mall, I guess. And I really thought... And, and she brought up that moving this scene from the mall to this in between the suburbs and the wilderness. And I thought it was just such a perfect... A, a, another example of a great way of expressing the metaphor of this movie because the suburbs are exactly that. They are far enough away from the city that all of the crimes and all of the bad stuff that you need to worry about from the city or as you're told as a Republican. But actually, like, you have coyotes and wild animals and just the wilderness right there on the edge of where you're living. And honestly, in the suburbs, it is much suburbs easier... Suburbs be dangerous too, boy. It is much. It is so easy in the suburbs, as someone who grew up in the suburbs, to wander off into a place that is far more unforgivably natural than you, as someone who grew up in the suburbs, knows how to handle. I was a Boy Scout. I learned about wilderness survival, and one of the things that I learned is it's very easy to not be that far away, actually, from a lot of places, and it actually being way more dangerous than, like, anyone told you. Like, if you were on a... Like the cities where you can call for help and there's somebody a stone's throw yeah. away to, to help you. Like that, uh, that video that trended That's on That's why Twitter. all the horror movies take place in the suburbs. Well, yeah, it's like the video that was on Twitter a couple weeks ago where that guy was out and then, like, that cougar... Hopped out because that. Dog, oh, oh yeah, the guy they, who was followed by the cougar and had to fucking. Yeah, because he approached its cub like a very, very not smart person. Um, but yeah, you know, I, there's a lot of places where like you can go on like a day hike for like thirty minutes, and like a cougar could eat you, and most people don't think about that, and that is what the suburbs are actually kind of like when you are in downtown Chicago. Chances are, if you yell for help, someone from somewhere is going to be like, hey, what's going on? You okay? Yeah. You got a thing? But like, and that's very much like the edge of, like, that's what I found so interesting about this movie, being in the Canadian suburb that it was. Um, which also, this Canadian suburb, um, uh, Bailey Downs, Ontario, shows up again in uh, Orphan Black. They kind of like just weaved the kind of, 
I guess they needed a town name, so they were like, hey, this town that we created, don't worry about it. It's just a thing that's a thing now. So those two universes technically are blended together, which I thought was fun. Apparently the high school that this was filmed in, they, they filmed the, the recent um, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, let's see here. What else do I have? Um, uh, I will say for a moment, when it comes to the cinematography, there's, uh, there's, there's, two th- there's a couple movies I want to talk about. Um, well, I, I, I just want to mention Sam Raimi. This movie, this movie owns a lot to Sam Raimi just in its widescreen photography and its use of of steady cam and its use of moving cameras. It is the scene where uh, the boyfriend is threatening. Was it Chris? Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jesse Moss. The scene where Jesse Moss is threatening the young child and she yes. plunges the syringe into his neck is the most Sam Raimi scene I have seen someone who is not Sam Raimi direct. And I'm not mad about it. I am saying walks away with John Fawcett. Yes, I'm saying John Fawcett, you nailed it, man. If you were, I assume you were going for Sam Raimi. And if so, you nailed it out of the park. It is so Sam Raimi, is the most Sam Raimi, it is the perfect Sam Raimi. And this movie owes... I would say the most to him, second most to Carrie, kind of in, in general broad themes. But yeah. I would say actually when it comes to structure, it owes more to Dead Ringers, which is a Cronenberg movie that is Canadian and uh, stars Jerry, uh, Jeremy Irons. Mm-hmm. As yeah, Ken. I've seen that one. Yeah. Yep. Um, just the, and it's one of those when the screenwriter mentioned it in the commentary, once I kind of took a step back and was like, oh, of course, it's two people who do similar jobs who are fighting back and forth and then having a disagreement between the two of them and then the confrontations between them, but then they end up working together. It's like when you find out that uh, most of Cabin Fever, the Eli Roth movie, is based on The Thing. And you're like, oh, of course, because it's uh, it's about a disease that gets inside people and they don't start trusting each other, so they back up. So it's a real... Oh, the bones are all there. I still always wonder where pancakes came from. Pancakes actually came from just that kid doing that. He had They had a audition, and that kid came in and said pancakes and did a bunch of flips. And Eli Roth was like, well, I guess that has to go into the movie. And it yeah, if you've did. not seen Cabin Fever... It's a goodie. Give it a watch. It's a very interesting film. It's um, so I guess sort of as we're getting towards the end of this, like, do you want like I'm and this is me being like I'm kind of curious about this, like how this rates in turn, like how this falls on your rating of werewolf movies, of all the werewolf movies that you have seen and are aware of, like how, where, where does this fall for you? To me, this is easily top five, if not top. Five. Three. This is up there with American Werewolf in London and oh God, OG Wolfman. Like it is real. Whoa, you guys! Because there's a lot of not good werewolf material out there. There's a lot of the werewolf of Wall Street. Uh, there's a lot of late f- phases. There's a lot of there's werewolf, all, werewolf cop. Uh, werewolf cop. There's a lot of movies that have. I will say ambitious creature design or effects, but then when it comes to the story, a real bunt of a movie. Uh, and this one, this one to me hit really. I was so impressed with this. This was uh, the, the, this to me is is one of those. I don't know. Do you have? Can you name a better? What? What, what is? What other better werewolf? I mean, like, like I, I the will, howling. Uh, yeah, which I still have not. You're gonna get mad at me. No, I, I, I haven't seen that one. Shame on you. Joe Dante's mad. <laughs> Look, I've literally worked with D. Williams, but okay, fine. We'll get past that. We will get there sooner or later. Shutter will, I'm sure, put howling on their network, and then we will watch it, and I will make fun of you, and then D. Williams and I will probably talk on Twitter. So that'll be a thing. <laughs> but yeah, I. I for one thing, I, I, I found this refreshing in the sense that you don't see a lot of werewolf films where it's a woman as a werewolf, which is which is such a missed opportunity for a lot of films because it, it 
I, I, I watched a review or, or an analysis on, on this film, and, and it was a, an analysis on both this film and Jennifer's Body, which I would argue Jennifer's Body is Ginger Snaps if the director, instead of lifting the writer up, said, what if we just throw tits on the screen and we market it like, you know, we want, like the boys are going to see tits when they show up in the theater. Ooh, I don't know. That's, I, I think Jennifer Body, Jennifer's Body is a much... Better film than a lot of people have given it credit for. No, like like the way the way that it's put out. Yes, no, the, the marketing. The is marketing trash. is the marketing is misogynistic as fuck. Yes, no, to, no, hundred percent. Also, Megan Fox is a good actress. Can we stop fucking saying that she's not? Because I'm sorry. The only reason people think that is because a bunch of pervy fucking directors had to fucking film the male gaze on her constantly. I mean, I think you mean Michael Bay because who else is like? There's not really a lot of people who have worked with her primarily from what I understand because Michael Bay has talked a lot of negative things about her which not cool Michael not cool yeah how he never got wrapped up in the Me Too that is situation is, is beyond me but you know someone that is a very good fixer it is what it is um, but yeah no I, it's it's one of those cases where the, the analysis came from the point of like there are films that are around the theme of the monstrous body. And it's the idea that the human body, as it goes through puberty, is monstrous. And nobody wants to talk about it because it's unpleasant, it's un, you know, it's uncomfortable. And the, like, the, like the best format that you can really have an open discussion about it is in a horror movie. Mm-hmm. And what better fucking type of horror movie to have it in than a goddamn werewolf movie where this shit happens. On every fucking full moon. Like, there's a point where Bridget says, oh, look, this, this, this tampon thing has a calendar. And she uses the actual feminine product as a way to determine when she's going to turn into a werewolf. She uses it as a tool. Oh, and she, it was also the scene with the counselor where she's like, oh, this is going to happen to you every 28 days for the next 30 years. Which is a real... You know, he, like, to say coarse to hair starts showing up where you don't want it to show up. Like, that's another fucking issue that, that people have to put up with during puberty. And it just, it covers all the bases. It checks off all the boxes. And I'm just like, like this was, I'm surprised more people didn't do this kind of movie. It's, it's one of those things where, the, I mean, that's why I think that, in particular, why Karen Walton wanted to bring up Ken Chubb's contribution. Because it's one of those things... Where you realize sometimes as a craftsman, as a filmmaker, that sometimes you're going to make movies that you don't have entire creative control over. And you're going to have to make compromises or you're going to have to make do and realize that, well, if I want to make a movie, I'm going to have to do this. And realizing sometimes that the tiny bumps, the tiny nudges the slight suggestions of like, do you guys realize this is like a really good period metaphor? Is one of those things where you stand up and you're like, oh my God, this clarifies everything. Like it just, it it just... That could easily be said towards a lot of Hollywood monsters. Totally. Most most Hollywood monsters, I would argue, are some form of sexual or puberty metaphor. There's some sort of change. There's some sort of other. There's some sort of becoming. There's some. There's there's almost always something there. But in particular, this one I think resonated really well. And uh, I, I think it's one of those. Ken noticed it, but Karen was able to because she was a woman, make it really ring true and not make it like a. Not make it hokey. Not make it like an almost. Not make it like a... Oh, man, you almost had a really good idea there and you just quite could... Like, you couldn't quite bring it all together. The main thing... Like, you you addressed it, but you didn't... You hit the ball. You were going there. Yeah. You you almost made it. Almost. So close. Oh, it would have been so nice if you got there. And... It, yeah, it, and it's one of those. There was a lot of people who came together and did, who gave their, who gave twenty five percent to make this tally up to like the ninety ninety five percent movie that I think this movie is. Because if nothing else, is also is a movie that does that did not have 
a lot of money. It did not have a lot of, it did not have any star power. It did not have any excuses. It did not have any well, cards the, in its sleeve. The main actress who plays uh, Ginger, once again, I apologize for never remembering the name, Catherine something. Um, uh, Emily Perkins or Catherine yeah. Isabel? Isabel, thank you. Catherine Isabel. She even talks about the fact that like when they made the movie, like they, they did the they did the circuit of um, film festivals. They did that sort of thing, and it really just kind of sat on a shelf and, and didn't you know didn't really get all that popular for like a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, I just remember being around it, and then like a friend mentioned to me that they watched this movie that I was in. I'm like, oh, you actually saw that. And then now it's kind of a cult classic. It's it's it, one of those movies that proves what the horror community does more than any other genre community, which is it hands around tapes and copies of movies to other fans that are like, "Hey, I know no one's talking about this. No one's giving me money to tell you this. I am telling you this movie rules, and you should check it out." And that doesn't happen in most other communities. There's some in the martial arts community, I would say. There's some definitely in like the Christian community. And then in the horror movie community. I just, I know very few people who are like, dude, you like comedies, right? And you're like, sure, I guess. And they're like, dude, you have to check out this really obscure, weird comedy. Most of the time that doesn't hit because it's a weird, obscure comedy and doesn't kind of do that. But like with horror, you get that a lot and you get it in specific Groups and a lot of people will find one, one particular part of the horror community to bounce off or react to, or they find out is just their jam, and then they want to see every single one of those Italian giallos, or eighty slasher movies, or werewolf movies, or universal horror films. They will find something that they just that just makes them resonate just like a tuning fork and I don't know for me this is this is that movie for werewolves mm-hmm. it's, it's just one of those I um, there's a movie whose name I'm forgetting um, with Matthew Perry and Salma Hayek and there's a line in it that's you're everything I never knew I always wanted and that's what this movie was for yeah. me it was like ah, oh, I didn't know that I had this particular itch to scratch and Oh, itch it, baby. Itch it so good. Oh, and apparently there's a, there's a fun little story that I, I came across when I was going through some interviews with some of these uh, with some of the actors. And Catherine Isabel talks about, um, as she describes it, he's like, oh, yeah, the scene where I raped my friend. Um, like, yeah, oh, no, I kind of had to get a little drunk for that. <laughs> and, like, keep in mind, when she filmed this, she was 17. Um, and so <laughs> she she... Remember, like, like in, in the interview, she remembers going to, it was either the director or one of the producers, and being like, so, I'm about to rape my friend Jesse, uh, which is pretty much, like, it's implied in, yeah. in, the, in this scene, like, where she's in the back of the car with this teen who definitely wants to get it on with her, but she pretty much just dominates him in yeah. a way that he doesn't like. Um, He's like, I'm the man, I'm it, supposed to be on top, and it's a real, if you know the myth of Lilith, like, nah. Yeah. Nope. 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 And then, then he's then he starts turning into a werewolf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But she like remember she's like like can you just, like 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 just get me like a rosé or something? I don't know what I like. She's like I'm 17. She's like just something something light. Something light. And he comes back with a couple shots of Fireball whiskey. Oh goodness. And she's like, "Oh, you brought the most unpleasant thing." Good. And she remembers going into her trailer and just she's like, "I can do this. I can do this." And just taking tiny sips of Fireball whiskey. Just to, just to get a little, just to get comfortable for the scene. Well, I know, I know the scene with her where um, she uh, kind of pounces on her sister. It's like uh, an hour and twenty minutes into the movie. Uh, according to the screenwriter, that scene was supposed to be a little ambiguous, where you're not sure if the sister has lost her inhibitions, and because of her animal state, she is somewhat sexually possibly aroused by this situation and that would make things complicated and she she mentioned on the commentary that the director backed away from it and I just want to say same 
would have uh, one of those <laughs> like which I, and I get it like I I've done a couple of scenes yeah where, a real where like, I'm just like I I oh uh, like I, I'm not there were scenes that I've done that I wish that I wish also... I had been drunk for mm-hmm. like there's like Serena Waits the film that that has been released recently like there was a scene where I am literally just in my skivvies um, hogtied literally with an apple in my mouth and this is my character's death scene and he he dies via um oh you know you know those little barbecue forks that you use to to flip the sausages Mm -hmm. and everything yeah my character has that shoved up his ass oh good times and so i during the filming of the scene am covered with the stickiest of fake blood so just even moving my arm up just feels like i'm ripping duct tape off of my side and I'm so ungodly uncomfortable. I wish, I wish I'd been stupid drunk for that film, because at one point, one of the actress, the, one of the actresses, says like, "You have very skinny ankles," which is not the fucking thing you want to hear when you're in the most vulnerable fucking place. Is someone commenting such, on your body? Such an interesting, weird, like. I mean, okay, I guess I didn't know I was upset about that but now I am and this and this scene like the shooting of this scene went on for a long time and the director did a great job of checking in and be like how you guys doing how you guys doing and then the other actors who weren't hogtied and were the ones doing the stabbing were like dude we can go all night we just want to get like the best shot I'm like I, I want to go all night I'm just like it. I want to be done now can we be done now like 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 no no we're not doing this any- and I also tried teaching them, like, because the, I've, you know, I've had a couple of years of stage combat training, so I, I know how most things work in that particular way and how you're supposed to fake stab mm-hmm. somebody. I showed them how to do it without hurting me. None of them followed that yep, direction. That sounds about And then right. I had little tiny puncture marks in my fucking side after that shoot. And it's just like, I get it, girl. Sometimes you gotta be a little fucking drunk to get the job done. There's... <laughs> To take us towards, take to take us towards the end. There is, there is. I want to quote Twitter in saying that if you can't handle me at my worst, then you can't handle handle me when I'm covered in jelly because I'm just too slippery. And that's what that story sounds like to me, David. Next week we're going to do something a little different. We are going to do what we are going to call a double blind episode. Because neither of us have seen the Shutter film Hell House, and we have both heard very, very good things mm-hmm. about it. But neither of us have seen it, so neither of us can really test the other one and see yeah. what's happening. So this is going to be our double blind episode where we're both going to watch a movie that neither of us have seen before. And maybe it'll be good. Maybe it'll be maybe it won't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. It's yeah. double blind. Oh, and apparently on Shutter, all of all of the hell and it's lately it's Hell House LLC. I think is how it's is, is how it goes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know what the context of that is. I'm I'm sure we'll find out as we watch it. Um, but I know all of the Hell House movies are on Shutter, including the director's cut of the original Hell House LLC. Interesting. Which apparently okay. was was then released by the director because he wanted to do more Hell House movies. Interesting. Okay. Like, all right. That you mind? A... Neither of us have seen this. Yes, we have like, no so idea. So just like this is one of those things where I'm like. like I suggested this. So like, like, this might be fun. You haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Like, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we. But we, Katie, this will be my fault this time. Absolutely. If this is not a good film, this one's on me. Yeah. No. Absolutely. This time you can blame your wife. The thing that we, I will say, we talked about it and we decided it wasn't fair. We originally thought that whoever liked the movie less, the other one got to gouge their eyes out, so it would truly be double blind. But we decided that. It was probably... 2020 was enough right now without one of us being forced to gouge the other one's eyes out for a podcast gimmick. Seemed like a bridge too far. So instead, we're both just going to watch a movie that we haven't seen. And hopefully, all of you out there on the internet will be okay with that. It looks like it's ripe with onset history and stuff that happened. Oh no 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 no! Uh, Hell House. Like oh, it looks like this okay. one. It looks like there will be a lot to talk about. All right, good. No, I'm 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 excited for it, and uh, we don't have to travel in time this week because uh, there's no choice to make. There's no podcast or there's no trailer to see. We're just that's what we're doing, and you're going to deal with it. Sorry, because, time machine. Because well, it's our podcast, and we'll do 
do what we want. And yeah, and and the and to be honest, the time travel machine needs a break. It like it, it needs, needs a week. The batteries need to be replaced. It's a whole thing. I don't want to go to Walmart. There's COVID. It's complicated. But the most important thing to remember is that the internet, that we love you, and that we will be back here next week with an episode about Hell House. We love you so much, you sons of fucking bitches. You beautiful sons of bitches. Uh, Goodbye, internet. Fuck you.